come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. The Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Hello and welcome to QP Online. It's a joy to join with you to worship. My name's Mary and I am the pastor for children and families at Queen's Park Baptist Church. Please say hello to each other in the chat as we gather and through our service, feel free to put your comments as we worship and learn together. Later on, Ian, our senior pastor, will be sharing with us from God's Word as we continue our journey through the New Testament. And today we're looking at Hebrews. But before we do that, some of you will know that I am a big fan of Christmas. Uh, It's only 27 sleeps to go, just in case you're interested. So it is a real joy for me to be with you today, particularly because this is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is that period of waiting and preparation. But we wait and prepare not just for this Christmas season, we also take time to look forward to that day when Jesus comes again in all his glory. So as we begin our time of worship, we're going to turn our attention to the hope of Advent. I'm going to read some verses from Psalm 130 and then Tim, Esther and Graham will lead us in song worship. There are two words I want to highlight in the psalm that I'm going to read um, and we're going to do that by using the Makaton sign for those words. So the first word I want to highlight is wait and we do that when we're talking about waiting and the second one is hope which is this sign. So if you want to you can join in with those actions when you hear those words. So let's read Psalm 130 verses 5 to 7. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord, more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. your name The mountain shake and crumble At your name The oceans roar and tumble At your name Angels will bow The earth will rejoice Your people cry out Lord of all the earth Please shout your name Shout your name Filling up the skies With endless praise Endless praise Yahweh, Yahweh We love to shout your name Oh Lord That's your name At your name, creation sings your story. At your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice. Shout your name, shout your name, filling up the sky. 
skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing. God, we will praise you, praise you, Jesus is our God, we will sing, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh. Shout your name, O oh Lord. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Sovereign God, O oh matchless King, the saints adore, the angels sing, and fall before the throne of grace. To you belongs the highest praise. These sufferings, this passing tide. Under your wings I will abide And every enemy shall flee You are my hope and victory Praise the Father, praise the Son Praise the Spirit
praise His name I'm fixed upon it Name of Thy redeeming love Oh, to grace how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be And let thy goodness like a fetter By my wandering heart to thee Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained. Like a fetter by my wandering heart to be Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it Seal it for to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. And here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for Thank you to Tim, Esther and Graham for leading us in worship today. As we start this Advent season, it's good to be reminded of the hope and the future we have in Jesus. Last week we heard about the opportunities that we have to bless our local community this year through the Christmas projects. And if you receive the QP update email on a Thursday, you will have had more detail on how you can get involved. If you don't get that email and want to, then please fill out the connect form on the website qpbc.org and we will arrange that for you. In a few moments, we're going to hear from Ian, but before we do that, let's pray. God, our hope, we rejoice that you came as a baby here to live among us, but we also long for your return. As we wait, we are so thankful for the beauty of your creation, for your hand at work in our world, for those places where we see signs of hope springing up in dark places. We thank you for the opportunities we have this Christmas season as a church family to be part of those signs of hope. We pray blessing on the space in Govan Hill and on those in our community who are living in temporary accommodation. And we pray that they will know your hope this Advent. As Ian comes and shares with us, open our ears to hear what you have to say to us this morning. And stir our hearts to love, to hope and to share with those around us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, welcome again to QP Online, where we are continuing to work our way through the whole of the New Testament uh, as we use the Immerse 
Bible study program. Some people are almost finished and some people are about halfway through, uh, but these are teachings that we can dig back into and reflect on as we work our way through the books of the New Testament. I do hope that you're finding it helpful and useful and encouraging as you seek to grow in your faith. Well, today we're going to zoom down on the book of Hebrews and uh, try and just extract some of the key themes from this uh, remarkable book and its word of encouragement to people who are going through tough times. About 10 days ago, there was uh, an earthquake. In fact, there were two earthquakes that hit Scotland. The very ground beneath our feet in this part of the world has been shaking. And uh, to quote Jerry Lee Lewis, there's a whole lot of shaking going on. Not just physical shaking, but relational shaking and psychological shaking, not to mention spiritual shaking. These past 20 months of pandemic have shaken so many aspects of our lives, no doubt more than we can even know. So here we are in this book of Hebrews. It's a message that's addressed to seasoned Christians, people who have grown mature in the faith, but who are finding that even as they grow mature, they are finding tough days. Uh, indeed, it appears that there is a, a new wave of, of persecution and trouble that is impacting these people. And the consequence, if you look at chapter 10, you'll pick up some of these things. Uh, the, the consequence is that some are abandoning faith. Uh, others are bailing out of church. That's uh, chapter 10, verse 25. And in chapter 12, um, we read that the whole world is being shaken. But, 12, 28, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So let us be thankful and worship God. So how do we stand with an unshakable faith, even as the very world around us is shaking? And that's the message of the Hebrews. And it's a very pertinent message to us today in this world that is shaking in so many different ways. And if I was to summarize the message very simply, it's this, buckle up. It's tough out there, but you've been given everything in Christ to get through this. You've been given everything in Christ that you need to get through whatever it is that you need to get through. And I'm conscious that many of us who will be watching this online are unable to get out and about in the way that we may well have done in the past. And so it does feel that we're having to go through something. And we need to be reminded of this truth that everything, we've been given everything in Christ to get through this. Now, I want to zoom in on chapter 12 uh, just for our reflection today. And uh, I want to use Eugene Peterson's translation or paraphrase rather of uh, chapter 12 to kind of help us to see what's going on. So uh, this is chapter 12 and I'm reading from the first verse in the message translation. Strip down, start running, and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race that we're in. Pay attention to how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. And he could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honour right alongside God. So when you find yourself flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item. That long litany of hostility he ploughed through, that will shoot adrenaline into your soul. And that's really what the writer to the Hebrews does. He invites us to fix our eyes on Jesus and to follow through on that long journey of faithfulness and fruitfulness that Jesus undertook in order to win for us salvation in this troubled world. It's worth it, the writer wants to tell us, because he's worth it. So fix your eyes on Jesus. And we're going to do that as we uh, walk our way through a number of the passages in Hebrews. First of all, Fix your eyes on Jesus because Jesus is God perfectly revealed. 
And that's how this book begins. Chapter 1, verse 2. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Now, tough times lead to us asking questions about the character of God. Is he truly good? Is he actually kind? And Hebrews is reminding us that when we begin to question the character of God in difficult times, then we are to fix our attention on Jesus. Because Jesus perfectly reveals who Jesus is. You know, many philosophers and academics want to know, what is God like? I'm sure so many of us do. What does God look like? Well, says the writer to the Hebrews, God is exactly like Jesus. God has revealed himself in person. Jesus says it himself in John 14 verse 9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now that means that the place in which we locate our trust in this world are not in the place, in the situations that we face, nor our speculations about the future. Tough times don't get to tell us who God is. God's character is not dictated, shaped, or changed by our suffering. God says to us that he is exactly like Jesus. Isn't that staggering? Isn't that quite remarkable? God says he shows what his true nature is in Jesus the carpenter of Nazareth, the healer, the teacher, and the suffering servant on the cross. And if we were to look at Jesus, well, there's so many things that we could see, but very simply, we know that he was not shielded from an ordinary life, nor even from exceptional pain. The God that's revealed in Jesus is not a distant consultant giving us advice about our lives, but he is an active partner, engaged with us, relating to us, through life. And he's not a cold legalist, but the God revealed in Jesus is a compassionate father. And we know that in Jesus, he has transformed death and suffering and pain forever by his death on the cross. Of course, we don't see the fullness of that just yet, but the Hebrew writer says to us, we still see Jesus. We have this anchor point. We have this visual um, authority for us to focus our attention on, which reminds us that God has broken the back of evil and suffering, and one day all things will be under the feet of his Son, Jesus Christ. So fix your eyes on him, because he shows us, even in our troubled times, exactly what God is like. And then secondly, we are to fix our eyes on Jesus, because he is supreme over all things. Now we may not see that yet, but this is the reality which is behind all that exists. Jesus is king and all things will be made subject to him. Evil and suffering and trouble themselves are going to go under the feet of Christ. Hebrews 1 and verse 4 introduces us to a word that's almost unique to the book of Hebrews and it repeats like a drumbeat all the way through. Uh, we could translate that word as better than, or greater than, or more excellent than. And right throughout the book of Hebrews, this word repeats. We read in 1 verse 4, Jesus is better than angels. In chapter 7 verse 19, Jesus offers a better hope. In chapter 8 and verse 6, Jesus offers better promises. In 923, Jesus offers a better sacrifice. In 1034, Jesus gives us better possessions. In 1116, he leads us to a better country. And in 1140, he plans something better for us. He is supreme over all things. And therefore, everything that he does is better than the best that we could imagine. And greater than the greatest power and trouble that comes against us. And right throughout the book of Hebrews, this uh, chorus repeats. So we know from chapter 1 that Jesus is greater than created things. This is chapter 1 and verse 10. 
in the beginning, uh, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. Jesus is described as the architect of creation and the centerpiece of all that exists, from the smallest subatomic particle to the unimaginable distances between the planets and constellations. They're made by him, they're made for him, and he sustains them by his authoritative, powerful word. Creation has been a place of trouble and difficulty for humans really throughout most of our existence on this planet. It's only really in the last couple of hundred years with the Industrial Revolution where humanity has been able to control, at least hope we were controlling, creation around us. For the rest of history and for many parts of our world, creation is wild. It's untamable. Humanity has been threatened by predators. Our life is dependent upon weather patterns and crop yield. Perhaps now, with the climate crisis, our fears and concerns have changed. The trouble is different. But we are still dependent on the creation that is around about us. But here we're being told that in Christ we have hope because Jesus is greater than creation. He is involved in it, he created it, and he will bring all things to his restoration and renewal. And we, of course, need to share his concern for this world. But he is greater than the creation. The second thing that we read is that he's greater than history. We're into chapter 3 now in the story of Moses. Chapter 3, verse 3, he, he has come, that is, Jesus has come to deserve greater glory than Moses, just as the builder of a house deserves greater honour than the house itself. Now, Moses was Israel's history maker, leading them into the promised land, establishing the temple and the practices and the, and the law and the way of life. But Moses, says the writer of the Hebrews, was just part of the building work. He was like a cog in the machine. He wasn't actually the author of that story. Jesus is the author of history. He is the name at the centre of the journey that humanity has been on. Jesus is the author of history, and history itself leads to him, to his birth and death and resurrection. Now, history tells a story of what happens to us in this world, and it's pretty restless and relentless. Uh, we face all sorts of challenges, great movements of political power, uh, great threats of conflict and of violence, great movements of thought, and we all are, to some extent, uh, bounced around and knocked about by these great movements that happen across our world and across history. But Jesus, we're told, is greater than these historical movements, these patterns. He is sovereign over all, all of these, and his plan and purpose will not be thwarted by the decisions and the plans of humanity. Chapter 4, verse 1, tells us that even in these great historical movements and threats and pressures that we're under, we can find a place of rest. The world may be raging, but the Christian can find rest in Christ because God has given us the gift of salvation, which we can step into and find security and safety in the midst. Then the third thing that we see is that Jesus is the greatest priest. He's greater than all the um, ceremonial priests of the Old Testament. We read about this in chapters 5 to 7. Now, Israel's priests, of course, these were the people who were uh, the gatekeepers who opened the doors of access into God's presence and God's pardon. We're told in 727 that he sacrificed himself for sins once and for all when he offered himself on the cross. So the writer to the Hebrews is asking us, even today, to fix our trust upon one who has opened up a doorway of permanent access to God that is absolutely sure and certain and reliable. We fix our trust not on the repetitive patterns of human beings who are following a ritual and may remember or may forget or may uh, be inadequate in all sorts of ways, but we are looking to one who has opened up this permanent way of access into God's presence, 24-7 access to forgiveness and help, 
24-7 access to the security of knowing that we belong to our Father in heaven. 24-7 access to the power of the Spirit. 24-7 access to intimacy with God himself. Let's make sure that we do not hold back, but that we choose to step into this living presence because he can be connected with anywhere and anytime. We don't need to go through a ritual because Jesus has made this one full and complete sacrifice. We don't need to find a temple or a place because what he has done is once and for all. So since we have confidence, says the writer to the Hebrews, let us draw near. And that's something we can do as we face trouble. And then the fourth uh, theme that we're to look at as we look at the book of Hebrews is there's no greater sacrifice. We're into chapter 10 uh, really here, or chapter 9 and 10. And we read there that Jesus is not only the priest who offers the sacrifice that opens the way to God, but he is a sacrifice himself. 9.12, he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood. God is in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Now, what could be greater, what could be larger than God himself rescuing and saving humanity and this world? There's no greater salvation. There's nothing more that could be done than what God has already done in Christ. This is a great salvation. It covers everything. It covers all things. And when we receive it and we step into it, we enter in to the, the fullness and the, the joy and the completeness of what he has for us. And even in that, there's always more. Now, I've just had my booster vaccination uh, just recently. And uh, to be honest, I'm feeling a little bit uh, sore in my joints today. Um, and I recommend, of course, that you do the same and get your vax as soon as you can. And I had a chat with a doctor who was administering it. And he said, this vaccine is better than what you had before because it covers everything that we know needs to be covered. All the new variants of COVID, all the new infections that are about, we reckon this is pretty much got it covered and you are pretty well safe from infection. And that's salvation for me through these next few months. But God's salvation in Christ is like that vaccination that covers every infection. Jesus' sacrifice is complete. His salvation is vast beyond measuring. It covers everything. That means there's no spiritual infection that could uh, grip our souls. There's no human failure. There's no condition which the blood and the work of Christ cannot and has not covered. Our salvation is complete. It is sufficient. It is vast. And we give thanks to God. So four themes in which God in Christ is greater, greater than creation, greater than history, greater than the rituals of the priesthood, and a great salvation that is greater than all our sin. We could stop there and say, hallelujah, thank you, Lord. I hope that you are doing that with me. But this also runs into a bit of application. So thirdly, I really want to say to us that the supremacy of Jesus is over our lives. And this is how Hebrews begins to turn towards its conclusion. In chapter 12, uh, we read about God's discipline being for our good. And in this, the writer to the Hebrews is, is realizing that the people that he is exhorting and encouraging are facing real hardship. But he wants to promise that in that hardship, there is transformation. There is benefit to be extracted from difficult times. As someone has said, never waste a good persecution. Never waste a good hardship, but use that to extract the goodness of God and the salvation that he offers in these times. What am I saying? Well, um, I want just to, to use an old spiritual saying. It's a medieval saying, but it's actually a, a lovely saying that really speaks to this. 
And uh, this is the saying, Jesus makes straight lines from crooked sticks. And we all, of course, bring crooked lives, things that are out of shape, misshapen, misdirected, and, and broken and, and, and damaged. We, we bring injured lives, lives infected by sin to him. But God promises to make straight lines out of crooked sticks. If you've ever had the privilege of being in Asia or Africa, or maybe you're from Asia or from Africa, you will um, know of how buildings are constructed using wooden scaffolding. I, it's one of these uh, images, one of these pictures that I just kind of really, really grips me from the very first time I ever saw that many, many years ago. And in those construction sites, you'll see higgledy-piggledy wooden structures that are built up, all sorts of crooked sticks, all sorts of uh, unusually shaped pieces of, of wood. And they're built up, but right in the middle of the scaffolding arises a straight and plumb building, often beautiful, modern building. And that speaks to me of what God does with our lives. He takes all of these crooked ways and crooked sticks and he shapes something, constructs something that is uh, straight and true and right before him, up from what we offer. Perhaps a way you might just think about it is that he can take rubbish and turn it to gold. That's how wonderful and amazing he is. You may have endured a really horrendous lockdown. Your nerves may be jangled, your brain frazzled. You may be really struggling uh, with all sorts of anxiety and all sorts of uh, grief. Who knows what you are going through? But God can take all of that and construct something that is beautiful and strong and stable from all of those broken pieces. Take heart, because God can use that stuff. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who um, was someone who spoke a lot about uh, death and dying and bereavement, and uh, she once said that the most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. Beautiful people do not just happen. For sure, we've all been knocked around a bit, but here in the goodness of God, by the power of the Spirit, and the constructing truth of his word, God wants to make something beautiful out of the rubble of these last two years. God is making beautiful people. And out of this ugly time, may he make you truly beautiful in Christ. Thanks for being with us today. I hope that's been helpful for you. And uh, I hope that you continue to engage with what God is doing and saying as we work our way through the New Testament together. Thanks to Ian for bringing that word to us today. It's good to be reminded that when we look at Jesus, we see God and his character. When our world is shaken, we fix our eyes on Jesus. That's what stood out to me from Ian's preach. What stood out to you? Why not share your thoughts in the chat as Erin leads us in a closing song of worship? Father of kindness, you have poured out grace You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of me. Lord, I can't help but sing. Oh, you're
promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. Beautiful Savior, you have brought me near. You pulled me from the ashes, you have broken every curse. Yes, and Redeemer, you have set this captive free. Lord, I can't help but sing. In your promises, my confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises, my confidence is your faithfulness. Thanks to Erin for leading us and also for that reminder that the hope we have is firm and secure because it comes from God whose promises are yes and amen. And thank you so much to you for being with us today. As we finish our time together, let me pray a blessing as we enter into the expectation and anticipation of this Advent season. The love of God the Father the hope of Jesus, God with us, and the comfort and peace of the Holy Spirit, God in us, be with us today and in the days ahead as we wait with expectancy. Amen. <laughs>